When you hear the tone, it will be just three minutes to showtime. Still time to visit the refreshment stand before the next feature starts. Showtime. and welcome to the Flea Pit After Dark program. I'm your regular host, Jeremy Brown, and it's been a few weeks uh, since the holidays that we've featured anything new here in the cold, desolate, and crumbling theater. But I always, you know, I always come around to something new, and I can't help myself. I'm sorry, guys. I can't help myself. But I am beyond thrilled to have this guest on tonight to talk about the movie we're going to cover. Uh, he is a Virginia-based guitarist and musician with the band XK Scenario. He is a film score composer by trade and an all-around horror movie aficionado, I've come to learn. Uh, his name is Alex Menick. He's the guy on the show tonight. Uh, Alex, how are you doing, man? How's it going? Doing well, yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I'm just, I just want to say I'm uh, just really, really happy I can finally talk about this movie with, <laughs> with someone, you know, because it's one of those things that I love kind of geeking out about some of my friends and um, you know, they haven't seen it. So then I feel like after a while, I kind of start to kind of, you know, I sound like a crazy person, like talking about this movie and, uh, you know, they, I don't know if they ever get tired of it or not, but, but, uh, so I'm just, I'm just really excited and excited to talk about this. So thank you for having me. 
No, great. I'm, you know, and this is a film, by the way, before we get into it, like this is a film uh, I've known about for so long. And I don't know what I was thinking, why I didn't even like bother to just sit down to, to you know, spend 72 minutes, 77 minutes or whatever, just to watch it. It's so short. Um, and now it's like, this is where it, it, the time is destined to, to, to screen it here, because this is of all the picks that we've featured on this show so far on Fleep It After Dark. This is probably as close as you can get from just a visual level on a soundscape level. And um, every little technical merit I give this movie, it, it earns for this show because we're in a very old, decrepit theater. You know, what's the last movie that would probably be playing in an old, decre decrepit theater? Probably The Last House on Dead End Streets, which is a film from 1973, uh, written, directed, produced, edited by and starring Roger Watkins, Ken Fisher, Bill Schlageter, uh, Kathy Curran, Pat Canestro, and Steve Sweet, with music by Claude Armand, and a plot synopsis, sorry, a plot synopsis that reads as, after being released from prison, a young gangster with a chip on his shoulder decides to punish society by producing and making a bunch of snuff films. I have an idea how we can make good use of this building. Maybe it'll break up the monotony. I want to make some films here. Some really weird film, and you two can be in them. Hey, man, sounds wild. Can we make any money out of this? <laughs> yeah. We might even become big superstars. Uh, with taglines like, it's only a movie, and it will scare you to death, and a $3,000 budget, mind you, what's not to love? Um, I guess we'll start off with... Uh, Alex, tell me a little bit about uh, your history with this film, how you discovered it, your first impression of it, and what kept you coming back to it, flocking to it, and um, praising it, singing all of its praises. Maybe it has some sort of influence on your own career uh, or your uh, interests or, uh, yeah, your your artistic creativity. I want to hear all about the, the, the Alex experience with this movie. <laughs> yeah, um... A few years ago when I, I really started to get back into into horror movies and I was kind of, you know, just kind of getting into different things and reading things um, as much as I could. Uh, I remember kind of coming across, uh, yeah, a few articles about this film. And um, I think it was really the just like the imagery that um, of like the, the stills that really is what kind of um, stuck with me after reading about it. And of course, a lot of the, the stories associated with this film, which we'll definitely get into. But um yeah, I, I just think like the, uh, you know, like the masks and uh, the, um, yeah, just just really like uh, striking um, just visuals that I saw from those stills that I think is what really um, stuck with me all this time and kind of like have it had it stick in my mind. Because for me, movies are all just like those visual um, aspects are what always kind of stays with me more than anything. So, I mean, just like one striking image like that is enough for me to remember a film even if i haven't seen the whole thing but that's that's usually my biggest kind of takeaways a lot of the time and especially for horror those are the things that kind of really um haunt me you know like long after i've seen the film you know but uh so uh yeah a few years go by i had this kind of film like those images festering in my mind and then uh yeah one day on like a really cold winter night at 2 a.m uh, i decided to give it finally give it a shot and um it uh going into it, it it actually almost even though it's um now it's so widely available but for years and years and years it was one of those um films that was uh you know extremely like hard to find and something of legends and of course like we'll get into but um it's one of the few films that almost felt dangerous like watching when i like put it on like something like it's cannibal holocaust too it's like one of those things where you know you put on the movie and there's that like heartbeat and like the title cards going I, um and uh I really felt like I was in for something. Um, and uh, I, I think when I watched it that night at, you know, 2 a.m. in like the dead of, you know, December, I think that was like the perfect setting for, for me to watch it. I, I think it's definitely a wintertime, like, you know, very desolate, um, frigid wintertime type of type of movie. I, I think you even kind of mentioned it was like your uh, chicken soup sort of movie where you were feeling really sick one day and you just had to like <laughs> put on something that was a little bit more uh yeah murky and and kind of dangerous and and uh evil you could even say <laughs> um no, just 100 yeah yeah no and honestly that's that's 
you know, I, I wish I had seen this sooner because like coming out of it, like this was so totally something up my alley uh, back in my high school years because I, I was aware of snuff films. I was aware of uh, this whole other genre of, um, I, yeah, yeah, I, I guess like trying to uh, s sort of like give like this glimpse into the, the world, the seedy underbelly of just uh, killing on camera and, and, and getting away with it. And, you know, th there's something so kind of dangerous about that. And it, it spawned all of these very uh, notorious films. Of course, we get Cannibal Holocaust in 1980. Um, I probably mentioned to you before in the past too, but you you had a lot of the uh, the Faces of Death movies and um, uh, the the Mondo Kane stuff and uh, showing like I guess the more brutality of 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 the times and and seeing what what you could kind of push and get away with. And the first thing I also took away, and it's such a cruel irony for today, but it's this abandonment of the the porno genre. Now we want to go to violence, because violence is what sells. Nobody's interested in sex anymore. They're looking for something else. Yeah, I know. I know all the weirdos, too. You know, I got a friend you might want to meet. A chick named... Nancy, Nancy, Nancy... Nancy Palmer. I picked her up in a bar and took me home for a little moist one before her hubby got home, you know? She liked the old slap root too. Crying all the time. I knocked the crap out of her in the living room. <laughs> and we're sitting around and afterwards, you know, she says to me, how'd you like to get paid for this? I said, what are you friggin' serious? Get paid for this? But it turns out, it turns out her old man gets paid from a little fag in the city to make friggin' porn movies for these hot to trot rich bastards who have nothing better to do than sit around and watch pornographic films all day. At least in the last decade in this time where explicit violence is just mainstream, uh, you could probably argue, um, the opposite now is kind of the the rarity so if anything this film kind of finds a, a weird in between and kind of planned ahead of time like knew, knowing like we were kind of headed in this direction um i'm sure you probably like took away a lot of those different kind of notes where it's like there's something about this like just from the the explicit nature of it um how it's presented but also how as a musician yourself like how it's uh musically told to um the soundscape in this we'll get into that later it is is kind of incredible no i i, I agree um al although this film uh, of course has like lots of nasty nasty stuff in it you know lots of guts like plenty of gore but um at the same time though i think at least for me the the the, the most disturbing parts of it are like you said the soundscapes and um you know like those uh the girls you know terry's group of misfits all in the mask and, and like you know laughing and you know mocking these people and like the just their uh just their demeanor and and the um just overall like the with like the lighting with how like the characters are often in this um you know kind of like illuminated spotlight where they're just covered in darkness i mean i think that's that's really the um for me that's like the true disturbing nature of the film in a lot of ways and um and uh yeah i mean well there's definitely a lot of, <laughs> i love to get into there about that but um so yeah what what was your kind of uh you, you said that you, you just finally watched this film um entirety for the first time like fairly recently right yep uh yeah it was it was really upon your request and i should uh yeah mention that too for anyone uh watching or listening that uh this was uh alex's and uh i'm glad he picked this one um uh normally it, it's usually like a a half and half give or take where where i either pick the film for the show or my guest picks the show or picks the film of topic um and i'm glad this one uh finally like surfaced for for the series uh but my my initial impression was um you know this is one of those movies where it's not very plot heavy and it's not even very character heavy either and i'm okay with that and normally i can't kind of give that i i can't usually respond to a film that well with those kinds of um with that kind of treatment but something about this is given that it's a three thousand dollar budget um it's a tight knit group of people all or really essentially friends working together on something in one location um coming right out of new york uh there's just something so fun and relatable to it even down to the point that I could enjoy it if there, if it was completely muted with music playing over the whole thing and it was just playing in the background or if it was playing at a party or something. It just has that sort of vibe to it. 
and uh and also rare given just all the uh all the buttons it pushes for the time because this is before texas chainsaw massacre this is before the exorcist before a lot of these classics blew up before even a lot of the the more notorious films uh kind of blew up and was really taking uh this cool stab albeit kind of uh silly and cheesy in places we'll get into the dubbing too but um <laughs> oh uh, yeah hey, listen now since we're situated in the old abandoned building up on the hill uh speak to the old blind guy who takes care of the place he keeps it clean he's an idiot but if you got some chicks living there just give him a piece of ass once a week and he'll fix you right up he'll cooperate with everything all right now as soon as i get out of here i'll meet you okay now now don't forget don't forget we're gonna get something good going there, right? Okay, okay, take it easy, Terry. Yeah, 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 baby, take it easy. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, baby, I'll see you. Yeah, take it easy. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll be up there, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think I've seen any other movie really respond to the Manson family murders in this way. I, it, it takes such a, it takes both a very silly but also serious um, response to to all of that and how that really impacted America at the time. And I also really didn't know much about uh, director Roger Watkins at all. Uh, this guy, he mostly did adult films. Um, he's got a very fascinating background just in that alone. And uh, to see him kind of among the ranks of other, some of the other greats in the horror genre, like I, I don't know, I was getting like David Hess vibes from him. Uh, I guess that also kind of, you know, ties into, you know, The Last House on the Left, how this film was marketed, you know, with the, the taglines and everything. There's a whole series of movies, I think, where it's just house on the, the edge of the park, on the edge of the street, or the, you know, dead ends, all these um, titles just to get people into that theater. And yeah, it seemed like one of these really just cool underground successes that didn't really find its audience until maybe 25 years later after its release. And it's, it's funny now to still read that people are still trying to push not only a, a fuller restoration of the, the longer cut or whatever other cuts may still exist, uh, but even a sequel, which I would be open to. But that you'd have to hand that, uh, I don't know, you'd have to hand that torch to a very worthy, worthy fan um, of this film, if not a family member or somebody that would really know the material well. But uh, yeah, that was my initial reaction. I really was just kind of blown away by... Uh, what it was doing for the time i was not uh i i guess you could say I'm, I'm these days i'm just much more desensitized so a lot of the violence a lot of the nudity a lot of the sex and everything it's not really shocking um but i would say for anybody growing up in this time right now it might be shocking for them because there is a lot of stuff here that you just don't see get made now and so that was my big takeaway it was like this is just a refreshing return to just uh full degeneracy and and cruelty that's an interesting point because um i i agree i mean lots of the violence in this is you know there's so many <laughs> so many like kids who grew up you know who of uh you know my generation younger a little bit older who you know grew up watching um you know like a Su saddam hussein execution video at like a family barbecue you know what i mean it's like <laughs> like we're, we we are like very used to seeing these images and and again back then it wasn't something that you would see as often especially because before the internet was available but um at the same time speaking of texas chainsaw um that was kind of a uh from what i'm aware of uh you know all the newsreels of the vietnam war that were constantly being um broadcast at the time so i think that was that might have been the influence as well but but it's an interesting point though because um, although, like, I agree, a lot of the violence in this, you could say, isn't, you know, wouldn't be as effective and compared to um, things that we've seen since then. Um, and I think one of my favorite scenes in the film, actually, that kind of comments on that is, um, so there's that scene where uh, two of the characters, one of them, um, so basically to kind of um, backtrack a bit, um, these two characters in the film are these, like, adult film executives who uh you know are these like kind of rich people who you kind of get the you kind of get the feeling that they're doing all this like decadent stuff and kind of getting away with it all and sort of in this like different world than like you know most like the rest of us you know and they're kind of trying to fulfill or you know fulfill their um insatiable like desires because they have like nothing better to do um so uh you have this one character who's like an adult film executive talking to 
uh, this character, Jim, Jim Palmer, who's a, uh, you know, kind of like a, a pornographic film director. And um, so Jim is showing uh, this guy, Steve, the uh, adult film executive, this, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this, this porn film that uh, he's trying to, to propose to Steve and try to sell. And then they're watching it. And it's like, it's definitely this super like overexposed. I mean, they even like comment and during the movie, they're like, that's some exposure there, which it is like, it looks, it looks, <laughs> but uh, they're watching this film and it's, um, it's funny because so so it's just a very like soft core kind of like really light kind of a, you know porn film of some woman just kind of you know just it's being sensual sensual just kind of like feeling herself and that's pretty much all there is to it um yeah, and, and uh, not, not not to cut you off real quickly here it did boast one of my favorite quotes it was a uh, Tom, you sit here showing me 10th grade porn while your wife is in the next room getting her ass whipped <laughs> and you have the nerve to talk to me about your reputation people People have tastes that have become awfully hard to satisfy. And you're getting paid to satisfy those tastes, aren't you, buddy boy? No, yeah, there's so much, like, there's so many funny moments like that. That's the thing, as dark and, you know, really disturbing as this film is, I think it's really funny, too, for sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so this film to this character, Jim, is, like, to him, it's, it's, uh, titillating to him, you know, it's effective to him, you know, but then you have, like, the, like you said, the, producer saying like this is boring this is you know this is slow this is like not interesting i need action i need angles i need something more extreme um and uh i kind of look at it as like the view from like a filmmaker who's the difference between a filmmaker who um wants to make a film just based on you know their own inner you know what things things that affect them you know things that they find effective or things that um you know they also they could find shocking as well or things things more like from within how they genuinely feel regardless of like how the market or the audience you know as as a whole would maybe feel about it um and uh i guess where i'm getting with where that is uh roger Watkins himself um when he was making this film he he didn't really want to make this like exploitation horror film necessarily. That was kind of the uh, sort of the at the time that was a very easy way into the industry to make something that um, could shock people. And then, you know, in, in that industry, that the, the films would just run for like maybe a week or two and then just would be done. But that was kind of his way into the industry to try to, you know, because he really wanted it. He said in an interview, his sens sensibility was more along the lines of like Citizen Kane or, you know, Fellini, like that was really the kind of thing he wanted to do. Um, but in the film, of course, there's these exploitation aspects that are dated, but the film itself still has this like very artistic and true quality to it. And again, I think the real disturbing parts of the film are, the, like I said, just like the imagery, just those like the, the, the more like inner fears and about like the, 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 you know, humanity in the film that I think uh, is really what resonates um, you know, to this day. So I think, I think it's just a testament to, as like a filmmaker, staying true to like what, you know, like, like what, what you kind of feel like in your inner, um, you know, sort of artistry. And I think that that kind of helps, you know, to touch on something that's more universal as opposed to trying to like um, follow whatever the current trends are and to like satisfy that because after a while, those things are always going to become dated and there's always going to be someone else who's going to come and do something even more crazier than that, you know? So I, I think, I think it's just a testament to learn to stay true to yourself as an artist actually. So that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. I mean, that definitely ties into um, even at the midpoint when, um, uh, when Terry kind of admits to uh I forget the name of the other Palmer, but uh, when when they're sleeping in bed together and kind of admits that, oh yeah, we killed that blind guy who owns the theater. Um, uh, she she immediately reacts like, oh, that's not funny. I'm like, well, that's not supposed to be funny. This is real. This <laughs> exactly. art is supposed to be real. You know? The way you strangled that man, that looked real too. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret if you promise not to tell anybody. Yes. They look real because they are real. It looked like I strangled him because I did strangle him. That's not very funny. It's not supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be real. And that's exactly what it is. And and there's something to that. And I think that gets uh, uh, abused nowadays. Maybe like it takes a lot of influence from something like this at the start. But like it was like those young, yeah, new filmmaker hollywood types that were trying to jumping into something that was kind of dangerous and big and 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 very different um 
and I, you know, I was thinking of other examples you would get before this. Um, maybe Peeping Tom, maybe Psycho, maybe a few of these other examples where they, you know, that everybody was always kind of um, on, like very close to that line on like well, how much can we show, how much can we get away with before it beginning becoming too uh, crazy and outlandish and and not okay for audiences to see and. Um, you know, I, I like as we were kind of saying earlier, it, it might feel tame in some areas now, but even still, like if if you really kind of put yourself in that time, and then you hear the audience reactions too, but you know, people saying like, "I'm disgusted by this, but I can't leave my seat." That's a really cool compliment to kind of get for anything you make, even if it's like you know, good or bad. Like you know, having an audience stick around because they want to be uh, challenged a little bit by just the nature of of the content of it is, is um, yeah, I don't know that that really does speak to the artistry of what Roger may have just kind of wound up into and didn't realize that was where he was going to really get his start. Um, I mean, thankfully, you know, later on in his career, and hopefully this was a, a thankful atonement for him, but uh, he, he was able to make a few more films, uh, many of which have posters that uh, are, I, I can't view on Letterbox for some reason, and I, I guess I know why. But <laughs> uh, yeah, one one of these very just uh, yeah interesting directors who had that venture into that genre and then did other things too. And a lot of filmmakers do that. You know, the movie I was thinking of when I was watching this too was um, the Driller Killer uh, mm -hmm. by Abel Ferrara. Before he really got into his more contemporary work, you know, he had to get a start with the slasher genre, like a lot of up-and-coming filmmakers especially of that new york scene had to do um there, there's something so fascinating how that still transcends even to this day uh you know just because because the, there is a scene there right now that is also still experimenting with every possible nook and cranny you can do with that genre um even if it's not something that they are quite equipped for or even care for really they'll, they'll just do it because they want to get seen no, I, I think I think I totally agree. I think that's great, and um, and I think uh, there is adding on to that. I think uh, that desperation, you know, of trying to elicit like something and a reaction, you know, like we, you were just talking about. I think the just desperation is a very um, is a theme to me that like runs throughout the whole film, actually, with the characters. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know, so you have Terry's group of you know his um his his family you know like the basically like you were saying there's a lot of parallels to the manson family in this but uh you know they uh all of them are in these like extremely vulnerable and compromised situations you know like you have the, the two girls who are just like you know they're selling their bodies for so they can eat you know for food i mean like they it's it's a pretty miserable existence there and uh and you have the cameraman bill who's this uh um budding kind of cinematographer but he he lives in a closet because um no one is like hiring him he's not getting any work uh and uh he's like you know d again desperate to kind of really do something with uh you know with with his passion and then you have um ken who's like just i mean he's just like completely he is like a, a case like terry tells him in the film i mean he's he's also in a similar position where he was also put in like an institution and he has resentment for that and then he's just overall like just is kind of like this powder keg ready to like blow up <laughs> and then that on top of the just like the uh environment of the uh like the setting you know it's just this uh where it was filmed it's 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 winter time it's like it looks just like it's freezing and very desolate and and the like the architecture of like these like decrepit buildings and um it just it just looks like a very uh <laughs> i don't know just like miserable and like yeah like i said desolate existence and um it feels like they're all desperate to uh to not only like improve their situation but also to um to really like feel something to kind of because uh, they they have like nothing left to lose and that's kind of how terry himself that's kind of how he's able to um you know sort of he, he takes advantage of that and then he himself is like desperate to kind of like get his revenge on society after you know what he viewed like you know wronged him and uh i think i think and also desperate just act out his like sadistic like fucked up you know fantasies on everybody and then and then also to add to that too um lastly um the uh the rich adult kind of uh 
uh, adult, you know, entertainment um, people, you know, they, they're, uh, they're like, de you know, they're desperate to also just feel any sense of um, uh, gratification, you know, I, I, like, I, there, I mean, it, like, there's that scene where, as you were saying, like, there are, there still are some things that even to this day are like, wow, like that, that you would not see that in a movie today. <laughs> but um, uh, for instance, I mean, there's like this scene where there's this like wild kind of sex party going on. And um, one of the main characters, uh, Nancy, uh, she's all done up in blackface and getting whipped and it's just like it's this like really really fucked up party and then like the um the guy steve the producer he's just sitting there like smoking a cigarette like just look like he could care less about it and then he walks out and he's like oh these parties are just such a drag like you know it's just like it's nothing is exciting them you know and then there's that again that need to kind of um do something and, and make something no one's ever seen before with this film and and to try it so i th i think that's a it, it just seems like it's all culminating and then it all kind of just by the end it just it just blows up and it's a it's um i i think I, yeah again i think that's a big part for me that's a big part of the film so yeah and it's um uh yeah, that need to to get more arousal out of something that has even stakes to it. You know, something that will actually uh, pigeonhole everybody into a corner where they don't know if they can get out or escape. And it's, you know, and I think it really speaks to that, to the Terry character in particular, who kind of floats in, you know, he gets out of prison, um, starts off really as an unreliable narrator, kind of describes briefly what his life was like in prison and uh what he missed uh i guess getting out and, and in real life and then it kind of just evades that at a certain point and this is kind of like an interesting inconsistency with the film is that you know you stick with him for a little bit but then he becomes this unassuming presence where you don't know where he's going to show up uh what mask he's hiding under um his next intention for a kill who he's targeting um it's interesting how they were able to still pull in all those little details in what's essentially a very short, you know, 77 minute movie that barely even is trying to just like get over an hour. Um, and it makes, yeah. Now you mentioned that this is like a, there was a three hour cut of this. Like they shot a lot more footage um, and only spent, I guess, $800 of the budget because of, uh, uh, well, I guess we'll say, um, our main guy here, uh, Roger, he had a little affinity for um, uh, the meth amphetamine and right. uh, spent most of the budget all on that. And it kind of shows a little bit in some scenes. Um, <laughs> yeah, what do, what do you make of uh, the length and the runtime of this? And and uh, I guess trying to make sense of it all in that in that amount of time when there was an existing longer cut of the film. I think that uh, it's a funny situation because. Um, so this film is often like praised for kind of that inconsistency, like you were saying, you know, and sort of how like things kind of, it, it does add to this sort of um, bizarre kind of feel that, uh, you know, does feel disorienting. And, and, and a lot of people point out about this film is that it adds to that, you know, kind of nightmarish dream logic type, um, you know, sort of feel. But uh, a lot of that is because the original cut of the film um, was cut up, you know, um, uh, on the, uh, you know, it, it, not under the director's approval. Um, and then, but, and then a lot of fans would, I saw like a Q and A where they would, you know, years after the fact, uh, go up to him and said, Oh, like we love just that, like surreal, you know, quality where everything feels kind of off and the dubbing's off and like the, the edit, like the narrative is a bit inconsistent. And he's just like, he's like, no, that's all like mistakes. Like that's all like, <laughs> like I didn't want it to be like that, you know? And it's, but, uh, so I, I think it's, it's interesting how, um, uh, you know, we, we can like watch these like movies and then kind of think that all this stuff is intentional, but, but it's not, but, I, but it doesn't make it any less valid of how it affects us, you know? And I think, and again, it's a testament to when you release something, um, uh, I think no matter what your intents are, I think it'll, a lot of times it take like a different life with the way the audience sees it. And I think that's something to, uh, if that wasn't your, always your complete intention. Um, I think it's something to, uh, yeah, in, in a lot of ways, just sort of, um, just be happy about you know and just just kind of accept and, and embrace it but uh um but yeah no um i uh I, I think the three hour cut from what i've heard uh definitely goes a lot more into detail about the characters and their motivations so i think it would make a bit more clear sense because i think it, it definitely like the first time i watched it i didn't quite 
get all the different threads of like the plot of what was going on because as you said it's simple but there's still things that feel somewhat left out and um you kind of have to then later be like oh that's what happened because it feels like there's things that are left out but um uh but uh i uh i i I, I hope you know one day we can see that three hour cut because that would be amazing but supposedly it's it's long lost and you know but hey you never know but uh yeah uh, but but and I, and I think it's really funny because um <laughs> there's that scene in the film where um he uh Terry finds out that these uh the adult producers he's working with are kind of uh they're like you know they're like butchering his movie or they're stealing it and you know and that's why he takes revenge on them and that's kind of what the what happened with the film in real life you know that's kind of like the distributor kind of butchered it and um because supposedly the film was more like i guess that he would describe as like an art film rather than like a straight up shock exploitation film um but the distributors at the time just cut a lot of that out and uh you know just just made it as one of those like quick kind of drive-in movies that they were trying to make a buck for like you know two weeks and then it'd be gone You've always had a special place in your heart for my movies, haven't you, Steve? You've always been amazed at how real they look, haven't you, Steve? Hi, Palmer. Well, tonight I'm going to let you all in on a little secret. <laughs> Cut down the blonde. <sighs> um, but uh, but I think the the the, the great thing though is that um the uh the artistry that he put in the film even though they tried to cut it up i think is still still there i think it's still very much present and um i just uh, i think it's really cool that how that worked out in a way yeah no it's 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 such a fascinating little uh yeah deep dive into that that underbelly like for the time and i have i have to ask you now like what uh have you shown this other people or have you introduced it or done little group viewings and what are what are the typical reactions you usually get um, from people who do see this film or, or people you recommend it to? Because it's not this is not an easy one. I would recommend to just anybody like I have to kind of get someone's taste and sensibilities like well in advance just to say, oh, yeah, check out that that last house on uh, Dead End Street movie. It's it's a it's a trip, you know. <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, you're you're pretty much the only one that, uh, like, for instance, at work, that I felt like, yeah, I could definitely talk to Jeremy about this one. <laughs> you know? Okay, okay, so, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's definitely, like you said, it's one of those. Um, uh, well, no, I actually, I've, I've never got a chance to, like, to to show, uh, to really show anybody the, the movie, but um, uh, I have I have talked about it. I mean, uh, you know, my girlfriend and I are big, like, horror movie fans, so I have... Uh, you know, I've definitely like she's heard me like talk about this movie like endlessly, and um, and, uh, I I I think I think she definitely wants to see it at some point, but um, but it definitely just are off the bat. I think is like one of those movies you have to really be in the right mindset for. So whenever that happens, I guess you know I'll subject subject her to to, to that. But uh, but yeah, no, and also I just think the quality of it. I mean, um, with just how like grainy and scratchy, which which by the way, I think like this film embodies that classic like 70s grindhouse look I, I think like this is the probably one of the best representations of that you know that everyone tries to emulate i think like this is this is to me like it, it's like the perfect um blueprint for that you know um uh but yeah no i, I think um a lot of ways just that it, it's definitely like hard to get into with how like dusty and scratchy and the movie mm -hmm. is and and like you said like the dubbing and and just some of the uh just i mean i mean it's a very like oppressive movie you know it's not kind in any sort of way which is why i love it i love just how like just just mean and just like um just angry it all is but but it's great you know it's it's fantastic so <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's funny I, and I'm, I'm sorry for the viewers at home or the listeners at home who can't see this but uh i'm you know i'm sitting behind uh like a good old texas chainsaw massacre poster and it looks like you got an infinity pool poster hanging up there behind you too oh, am yeah. i right yeah 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 both both films that kind of deal more with uh class and and other things too and and the hedonistic nature of of uh yeah uh, and, and the impression as you brought up of what that brings and what, what comes with that in a in a horrific nature what what's so fascinating and how that kind of times in ties in with uh this film is that this is more just a response to what was happening at the time and doesn't really i mean obviously there there's some there's some things to pull from with like especially the two girls who are just in poverty and are starving and are looking for any sort of work or anything to kind of give them 
as sad as it is to say meaning in life right now at the at the at this point in their lives um uh they don't really touch on like those other topics it's really kind of just the the reactionary stuff of the manson family and how that kind of affected everybody how people viewed um the hippie movement at that time and the 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 wedge that kind of put into everybody's kind of uh cultural fixation with it and this is like both from uh yeah i guess someone that was really interested in that but also wanted to be daring and show the 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 bad side of that i guess you know and um i think whenever you see movies kind of pick up on these patterns and want to be really brutal like this they usually come from something that's a little bit more uh cultural or socio-political that's not just an event it's really like something that's more all around us and this film feels very specific to that which i kind of admired on its own merit because you know it, it could have there could have been a scene maybe i don't know uh roger watkins wanted to have a monologue where somebody's like spouting their uh uh something they learned in college and uh like something very meaningful their oscar moment um but it never really goes there ever it's it's kind of this just very matter of fact these people are kind of crazy but they're also kind of lost and not that you sympathize with them really you just you you just kind of see the madness for what it is and how that kind of spawns to other people and how it creates a new family dynamic that's yeah kind of messed up yeah and uh a funny little fact here is that um well, it's not really so much funny, but it's it's pretty disturbing if it's true. But uh, the uh, the idea um, uh, with the Manson inspiration is that uh, there was a rumor um, very early on after the murders had occurred that actually the uh, family members, um, uh, they, they filmed uh, a lot of the murders that they had done and were selling them uh, kind of like on the underground black market. That was kind of like a um, something that was mentioned in one of the early books that uh dealt with that were that were you know that came out at that time um so that's where like that's where the idea for this film came that that it's, it's not just these people you know kind of cutting people up it's like we're gonna make a film out of it which you said was like something that at the time uh yeah just just seemed just seemed like very original you know and and uh i think and and adding on to that i think in a lot of ways you know there's a lot of movies about making movies you know and uh, I would easily just put this in that genre. Like I, I would put it in the same breath as like the Fablemans, you know, <laughs> like it, it's, I think it says a lot of, or, you know, I think it says, or nope, or, you know, what have you, I, I think, uh, you know, or like the other side of the wind, you know, Orson Welles. Like, I, I think it, it, it very much for me, like I would, it fits in that, you know, obviously this is in a more, it, it talks about just like the more, uh, <laughs> more like very, very fucked up side of things. But, uh, but, I, but I think, I think it really says a lot about it personally. That's a really good point, actually, too, because I, I don't think audiences at the time could really relate to that, where uh, you have characters who are just, you know, pointing and shooting with their their um, yeah, their super eights and, and, and whatnot. And, and it, it, I guess just in that time period, unless you were doing some sort of like family home video of your barbecue or vacation, um, you know, like everybody was very alien to that sort of like lifestyle. Um, this was very much coming from the minds of people that went from film school early on, were very inspired by the classics, loved what uh, the pictures were doing, and then wanted to be avant-garde with it, too. Because, uh, you know, at, by this point, you know, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, a lot of these guys were, were showing a different edge to that and, and giving it something new and inspired people, especially in the New York scene, to... Uh, tell people to pick up a camera and make a movie and you know three thousand dollars as a budget is is still pretty sizable back in 1971 1972 but even still uh you're looking at like well under a million which is a very decent amount of money to to fund anything and <laughs> you know it's such a it, so saddening that so much of it went just to drugs like because i I'm, I'm, I'm now wondering like what how more overproduced could this movie have looked like if they had like used the full budget and uh yeah not fallen off the wayside a little bit there behind the scenes but you know also mistakes like that usually like spawn some of the greatest little horrors 
uh, in films like this. So maybe it was just like it was luck by chance. Maybe this was a yeah, maybe this was a stroke of luck. <laughs> I, I think so. And, uh, you know, and that's also an interesting point, because, I mean, you know, who knows how many big, you know, major uh, motion pictures that we know and love, like we're also, you know, very much influenced by by that kind of extracurricular, you know, uh, sort of influences, you know, there as well, but we just don't necessarily know about it. But uh, but I, but that's what I love about this movie too is that it's just very unapologetic and you know real in that. And uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what were um, I'm just curious to know from from your end too. I mean, what were some uh, just sort of like things that like once you were once the movie ended, things that like really kind of like stuck with you, whether it's like image wise and like I said, like the music. I mean, things that kind of um, just on the pure, like the, the filmmaking itself that really kind of, uh, like stuck with you afterwards. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, dubbing aside, which I would say like, this is some next like bottom tier dubbing. Like <laughs> I've seen better giallos do the dubbing be process better than this, uh, points where like you're two seconds apart from the words you're saying. And that's why you can kind of tell there's so many shots where they shoot them from afar or behind somebody's head or why even a lot of the characters are wearing masks they want to you know they can hide the lip movement and and get away with it a lot more in the gestures uh but uh i would say i think it's just it always did something kind of visually different i didn't know like how they were going to execute any of these kills on camera um uh one image you know that comes to mind i guess is the 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 hoof coming out of uh, the guy's uh, zip fly um and just kind of like torturing the the executive with that uh i don't know there's something like just so like crass and and offbeat about it that i i, I was i was secretly kind of laughing a little bit but also like <laughs> this is just horrible <laughs> degeneracy yeah. like right on camera like this guy like as much as you hate him doesn't deserve any of this um yeah and uh i think from the beginning and maybe even how it kind of reflects in the end too there's uh i think as we were kind of saying earlier it just it the films that kind of draw me the most the ones that kind of bend fiction and reality and never is this movie go the full found footage route but it does show you some footage that they shoot to escalate the, the i guess the lack of plot that there is but just to kind of show like what they're actually doing um and it gives it this really creepy aura that um you know these are people you could know in real life doing this kind of thing at this time and you uh yeah there's a relatable quality to that that makes it extra scary like now we're 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 more so in the real world than we are in like the supernatural land of horror um of terror of of uh yeah feeling uncomfortable um seeing just just very blatant brutality like up front in this way i think is uh it's a challenge because sometimes i think a lot of directors um like to hold back um which is respectable i think uh if done well that's probably the best route to go sometimes you got to see things for what they are up front and this film is a an easily uh good example of that kind of provocative sort of filmmaking where um yeah you're 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 kind of seeing madness just on screen um yeah i don't know like but i'm i'm kind of flooded with a lot of different uh sensory experiences with this movie cuz it 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 goes by in such a brisk brisk pace i kind of wanted it to take its time a little bit longer and i um yeah i i i really hope that 3 hour cut does come because there were shots, uh, I want to say, like, even in the opening where uh, uh, the blind guy's, like, walking around in shadow. Um, by this point, we know nothing about this guy. We don't we don't have any context on what he does, who he is, um, where we even are, really. Uh, and, and, and there's also really perfect cutaways to just uh, Terry's love of just uh, violence and torture and, and malice and everything. And... Uh, they're they're executed in all these like really neat little spots, and if you uh, if you don't pay close attention, you might actually miss them because they're almost like these split second flashbacks or or cutaways to something that's gonna happen soon. 
Um, and it kind of gives the film a much more experimental nature where it's not relying on being a full on narrative other than just a small little revenge plot by the midpoint. And yeah, I was really taken aback by the simplicity of that because no one, I think there's this fear right now of uh, people wanting to make something of that nature because I think uh, everybody wants to get in bed now with the critics and and uh, the higher ups in Hollywood and they don't want to do anything that's too daring. Whereas I don't think Roger at the time, I don't know now, but uh, at the time I think he was just wanting to make something just to make something. Uh, and uh, you know, it's classics like those that take they take just an extra bit of time. They take many years before they have this uh, the status, this cult status. So I think that that overall, I think that that was what I really kind of took away was that it it just took a lot of time to build, but it was doing some so many things that so many directors that we praise, so many filmmakers, so many artists um, are the ones that kind of like take the credit for, it, even though they didn't start it. And that's yeah. I got to give this a rewatch just to see like other little techniques he, he uses here because it's really kind of cool uh, how he pulls all of that off. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, there's a lot of great, um, you know, kind of moments uh, that there, there's there's this film also feels, I guess you could say, like cinematically literate. You know, it, there, there's a lot of references to a lot of things here and there. And um I mean, I just, I even think, I mean, the last like 20, 30 minutes, I think that the atmosphere of that with uh, the music definitely contributes to it, but um, something about the, uh, like the spotlights that are being, um, you know, shine on like the victims and, and just the way that the darkness, it, it really did actually, funny enough, I mean, it, it created a similar type of atmosphere is um, for me, like the scene in uh, 2001 where they were on the moon and they, they visit the uh, the astronauts, visit the monolith on the moon. I, th I think it very much felt in the same, it, it was almost hitting that same height there actually for me. And uh, I, I think, uh, I think, I think if, if, if you're, if you can come close to imitating that type of um, uh, atmosphere with, a, you know with like a five dollar movie basically I, I think that really says you you kind of like know what you're doing <laughs> you know i think yeah. that's a i think it's a huge achievement there um and uh well like the 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 other thing too is that um i really love how this film um it definitely like we were kind of talking about it it definitely feels like it's it's making a um like it's commenting on like the uh yeah the exploitation of not just like that genre but just of the film industry itself but also that the movie itself revels in it very much and i kind of i think that juxtaposing um nature is great because um it, it doesn't it doesn't feel as though it's uh there's a lot of movies you know where, where it almost feels like it doesn't have a spine where it, it, it presents these different ideas but then um almost kind of like there's like a cop out where it doesn't want to really take any kind of stand on anything which i think is but 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 in this i think it's done in in, in an effective way you know i think it um yeah, I like how it doesn't just take a oh like this stuff is 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 uh is degenerate or whatever because it's actively doing it too. So I it, I I just I just love that um dichotomy there a lot. And and uh and, and one thing that kind of struck me as well is um you know at the time like the whole grindhouse industry was something that was meant to break off from mainstream Hollywood, which is funny because uh exploitation films as we know uh we're always part of Hollywood from the beginning, from the movie industry. So it's 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 almost like this, you know, as far as like historically what I read is, it's like this bastard child that Hollywood tries to kind of like, you know, like throw throw kind of like sweep under the rug, but it's always been a thing. And, and I mean, there's a lot of movies that come out nowadays by major studios that you could maybe argue exploitation films in some way. Cause you know, as we know, exploitation is mainly, um, you know, taking a current trend of taboo and exploiting that it's not necessarily, uh, you know, like gore and like breasts and yeah. like these kinds of things that most, you know, you would mainly associate, but, but anyways, what, what struck me was the, the fact that even in this alternative underground industry of the grindhouse sort of, um, uh, way of doing things there still is a lot of constraints and pressures to sort of deliver a certain product as well you know so even in that outsider mentality there was still this um pressure to do something shocking and there's a lot of confines there too but um but i love how the the director of this film still injected his own um sort of uh 
ideas and um, artistic kind of stamp at the same time. So I, I just think that's a really, really great thing. I think it's like unique and just, just it, it, it strikes a chord in me, you know, so. No, yeah, we, we, we like to see the underdog, you know, the, 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 the guy that's like trying to get by and um, even if he, he's, hardcore into the drug scene you know <laughs> we still like to see what they can like come up with yeah and i didn't realize he he died like in 2007 um and didn't realize what kind of reception this film had had uh like up until maybe like the end of the 90s which is kind of incredible like once inter once the internet like got got big and forums and and threads uh were starting to build and google was a thing um he, he just discovered like in like the last few years of his life, those, what kind of reputation this movie had and how hard it was to even find and uh, navigate towards. Cause it, uh, yeah, for at least over 20 years, this was just kind of being passed around and then eventually bootlegged and then restored. And uh, you know, these are the kinds of movies that, you know, when, once somebody sees it, like they remember it. You got my cameraman, he's a damn good cameraman too. And you got my girls. And they'll do a good job for you. And if you do a good job, I mean a really good job, you never can tell. You might be up for an Oscar this January. <laughs> so another part of like the history there is that for for a very long time, um, the uh, the movie was actually um, you know similarly to a lot of other like titles like Cannibal Holocaust too like uh, before the uh, the internet kind of revealed all of this um, the the film was only available through these like uh, you know just shoddy like VHS tapes and uh, a lot of people did you know kind of wonder when they would find this movie if maybe perhaps some of it was real and um, you know I know like a lot of people clown on people from back then oh how could they think this is real you know but I mean I don't know I think uh, nowadays. We're a lot more um well i don't know about that completely but i think some of us are you know more media uh like literate you know when it comes to media yeah. you know so we can tell like what what's fake and what's not but you know some of us of course but um uh but i think back then i mean again it's there wasn't as much um context for any of this and uh you know if you're looking at this in some tiny like tv and you get this tape that's like unmarked and you have no idea where it came from i mean i mean i i could i could see why some people would you know um, especially people who don't have a lot of knowledge of filmmaking at all, I think, you know, could maybe start to wonder a little bit, but, um, but yeah, so essentially, uh, something that added on to that was all the names, uh, in the credits are all pseudonyms because, uh, simply because once the distributors recut the movie, the director was like, this is like a piece of shit, you know, I don't want anything to do with this. Um, so he, uh, just then just told them like, don't put my name on this, like, piece of crap you know I, I just yeah just let me just forget about this so um that inadvertently led to more of the mystique it's like because when people would try to research these names it would lead nowhere because they seemed like they were all like fake and you know that's something that yeah you, you would see that, that that would you know happen in uh someone trying to make this kind of movie like illicitly but also it's i mean their faces are in clear view too so um but anyways, I mean, there's a lot of things like that that sort of added to the, you know, kind of mystique behind it. And um, and it's now we can just watch it on Tubi for free. So it's I know, a yeah. really beautiful thing about it all. <laughs> it's great. No, our own homes. <laughs> right, right. And, and you know, um, I was going to bring that up. Uh, I guess in this recent version, too, the credits roll that it's directed by Victor Janos or Hanos. Yeah. And people thought this film was being uh, paraded and passed around like it was through the uh, the mexican mafia at the time and it's just like we'll pick whatever name we can get and we'll just we'll slap it <laughs> on there um yeah that was the the fun thing i noticed about all the pseudonyms is that they usually have all matching similar first names and then they just kind of made up a last name for that character but you know if you're like the the average layman watching this film you you wouldn't remember any of the characters names really you would just watch it for the yeah for the, the brutal kills and the and the and the film reels and and everything else the sex if it's there <laughs> yeah, but yeah. um it's it's uh yeah no i think it's it's a cool little cool little entry into that underground cinema scene and i um i think it was also getting tossed around in the I, i'm sure you know all about the the video nasties period in the uk and uh their call for censorship on like a lot of the I brought this up on a few shows, but you know the the uh, the distance that both 
the U.S. and the U.K. have is that uh, U.K. is all about um, sex and 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 you know putting yourself out there and and um, that kind of whole liberation that that freedom. Uh, but they they're usually naysayers when it comes to the hardcore gore, at least around this time. And then America was kind of the opposite. It's it's a weird little thing where they were like, we're, we're going to cut down porn as much as possible. We don't want people showing off any sort of, yeah, we don't want people showing off themselves at all in, on film. But we we will we will play up the violence we have to. We will do whatever we can. And there was like, there was both a mainstream and an underground scene in I think both circles. And it's weird how both of those are so juxtaposed. Um, but I remember, yeah, uh, like looking into when I had first heard about this film and this was many years back, how, um, this was one of those notorious entries where it was just not a, a film seen by a lot of people in the UK for a long, long time. And then you had a lot of film critics like Mark Kermode who would like really promote it and, uh, try to get people to not make all of these like instant calls for censorship just because it, it could be offensive to the the public masses but you know something like this always has like a curiosity i think for a lot of people and and it's always fascinated me over over the years oh well yeah i think uh i mean i think it's it's true that um and anything that kind of has like uh, like a notorious sort of backstory to it and you hear about like the crazy things that are in it i mean just naturally as, as people we're always drawn to that and um we're, we're always drawn to do things that people tell us that we shouldn't do and especially when we're kids and um so i, I think it's an innate thing um but uh but you know but 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 i still think um it's uh a, a lot of a lot of this stuff is like in the film i think the most effective parts are um more of the simple sort of just uh like the atmosphere and and um the themes there and i think uh I, I think all of the violence can be definitely like a vehicle for all that. And, uh, and, and this is still one of those films that I think all the violence makes sense. You know, it doesn't, it, it, it maybe could come across as like, it's just being shocking for the sake of it, but, but I, I would disagree. I mean, I mean, I think it all kind of, uh, with, with like the way the, um, these characters are just kind of like the way in which they kill all the characters is, is in a very mocking kind of way. And it's like the sick joke to them. And it, and it's something that they would, you could totally see them see them doing and and it doesn't it really doesn't feel as um sinister as something something like some other modern films that i i i think really rely on that like a little too much you know so come on ed don't get nervous you've been doing this all your life now keep your mind on the movie <laughs> It's more speaking to the artistic prowess of what I think Roger was really kind of going for. Um, uh, it, it, I, th- I think I, I sometimes get a little caught up in like the reception of, of films. And I, I think sometimes there, there's always like a disconnect, I think, from what an artist is fully realizing sometimes and then what an audience will interpret or take from that. And, you know, and that's the that's the fun thing with art is that like it's always up for multiple, if not infinite yeah. amounts of interpretations. Um, and, and I, uh, coming back to the music a little bit here, what did you, um, I guess in rewatching for this show, what did you make of, uh, some of the soundtracks this time? And do you see as a, I, I was, I would ask as a, as a film composer yourself and as a musician, as, as yourself, like, was there anything you might've taken sort of little cues from or influences that, uh, certainly, um, play into like the kinds of stuff you like to create? Oh, 100 percent i think uh well the the cool thing too is that uh this the score for this movie is actually taken from just like a uh, library stock music that was available at the time um and there's actually a cut in there that's uh composed by none, none other than uh, delia derbyshire you know very pioneering um electronic music composer uh and um well i mean i i think what i love about the score so much is that it's not particularly musical score in that tradition i mean i think it's still musical but not in that traditional sense there's no there, there, there's one um there's one track where um you have kind of this the, the, there's this chorus of like voices and it kind of swells and it feels a bit more melodic but for the most part i think uh 
it, it was a lot of music that was very experimental for that time and still i mean still sounds like very freaky to this day i think but um but uh i i i just i'm very appreciative of scores that kind of more take use of just something just a bit um more about like the just experimenting with different sounds in that way and and uh rather than trying to create like things that like like hooks that stick into your head and uh and um you know something that that kind of like serves as more of a blanket to everything um but a lot of it does feel extremely assaulting at times and there's times where like if you have your volume up on it it'll like you know like it'll it'll really be like it'll hurt you pretty bad um so i like that too i like that little danger there as well yeah yeah there's like a a, a mystery like almost yeah where where were these composers when they were making these soundtracks and yeah where where was their head at at the time uh absolutely I, I, even you know i think the opening heartbeat uh track is boy is it a contender for uh any marcone is the thing in in many ways i think oh, there's wow. something kind yeah, of really yeah. special about how more raw it is i don't know if you got the same kind of impression but it's uh uh I couldn't tell if I was if I was feeling our main character's heartbeat or if it was just uh, like a figurative musical heartbeat that would rapidly accelerate, you know, as as uh, we're whereas the viewer kind of like pinned down and watching the film. Um, I got like a weird little visceral auditory reaction just out of that alone. Um, that was cool. <laughs> That's great. I mean, and uh, I I also found it to be. Um... As you said, it it is it it does get you uncomfortable, but but it was a lot of the the soundtrack is actually very like to me it's kind of relaxing too actually. I mean that's just me, I don't know, but like it's definitely something that uh, and and again in a weird way the oppressive atmosphere of the uh, of the film actually um, that scratchiness it, it it does feel cozy actually a little bit. It does feel uh, feel nice and yeah, I I like it. <laughs> I like it yeah. a lot. Alex, how would you, you know, and I, I ask every guest this when it comes to the film we're covering, and we've covered every, you know, branch, broad uh, Hollywood film to just like the seedy underground underbelly of, of weirdness. Um, a film like this, which is not an easy film to market. Oh, you know what? Before I get to my question, great teaser trailer for this film, by the way. I don't know if you've uh, caught wind of this many times, but it had that like before like Suspiria did that one teaser of like the roses are red uh sequence uh just that face uh it's so haunting to this day I think just like that little reveal the little head twist around and um gets you right into the mood of what you're in for but in many ways I would say that teaser is probably scarier than most aspects of this movie which I found more just enjoyable but but what a great teaser it's only a movie Remember, it's only a movie. Black House on Dead End Street. Rated R. I, I love how the teaser is... Uh, I, I love the fact that it's not at all from the movie, actually. I, I like... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that's something that um would be interesting if we see a bit more of. I, I, mean, I don't know who would want to do that, but I, I, I kind of like that, how it it just has nothing to do with it but then um still somehow fits in a weird way i i i, I think that's an interesting idea i actually kind of think that uh, that should be used more um even though it tells you nothing about the movie but i i just think it's uh i think it'd be something a bit different you know and 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 you would avoid the problem of like that a lot of people have trailers revealing too much about things so um i think it would kind of catch people off guard but sure anyway sure. it's kind of a side thing there but <laughs> you got to get those butts in the seats <laughs> yeah 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 um how would you recommend this movie to somebody who is somewhat curious but unsure if they would like it or not and if they have at least some background or history with this uh specific genre um because it's not an easy film to market uh it, it's not an easy film to just kind of recommend to anybody who especially anyone who's who's watching more of the mainstream stuff and is comfortable with that how would you 
yeah, what, what what is the Alex Medic pitch, I guess, for uh, <laughs> The Last House on Dead End Street? Huh, that's a good question. Um, I I would say, yeah, if, if you really want to see um, just, I, I mean, I, th I think, again, with horror movies, it's like the thing of, of us seeing these uh, really dark and depraved things that um from the safety of not actually participating i i think i think this movie embodies that i think in some of the best ways possible me in a very extreme way like for sure but um but you know i i don't you know when it comes to films that deal with you know people getting tortured and extreme gore i i really wouldn't say that this is on the same level as maybe some other things because i know that um i mean i myself actually like i i don't really um not a huge fan of the films of this similar type of genre um really much but for some reason i can i this one i can i can take you know this one you know i, I can do it for and i think uh, i think that really speaks for the uh yeah just just how much more there really is to the film and and, and I, I would say again just like the of course like the disturbing aspects are um are really fun but and uh you know fascinating but in that way but but i think that's honestly to me it's like some of the least interesting parts of the film and i think there's a lot of things going on here that um uh, I haven't. I think that aren't talked about as much, regarding like uh, the the film industry and um, just the overall like kind of themes of the film. I think is something that uh, like I think for me it's up there with any other any other classic kind of horror horror films or greats that we all love. You know, but that's just me. So and, oh, and also I'll just add it. It's one of those things that um, after I first saw it, I did feel kind of cooler after watching it. Like I'm, you know what I mean. It was one of those things where I'm. You know, I kind of felt like, yeah, this this feels like something that um, is, uh, again, just even though it's like easy to find, but it, but it, but it still feels something that you kind of discover, and then it's like uh, it's like your little kind of secret, you know. So I think yeah. that's uh, that's what I love about it as well. Yeah, you you came out of it thinking like, yeah, Roger Watkins is literally me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, no. and adding on to that, I just want to say real quick, that was um, I, I think his performance in this is uh, is you can't take your eyes off of him. I mean, he's as sadistic and fucked up and horrible character he is. I mean, he looks like fucking cool in this movie, you know, with like that leather jacket and his, his whole demeanor. And um, you really can't uh, look away. And God, I, I just I, I think there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of things that make me laugh with his performance in it where. Um, there's so there's that one scene where um, the those film executives are all tied up and um, the Nancy the woman she's still kind of in disbelief and whether or not you know they're be really being murdered or not if this is real and um, the other character Steve he already he already knows what's going on here he knows that this is for real and he's telling her it's like oh this isn't even a movie this is for real and then and and then uh, Terry you know played by Roger Watkins comes out of this like dusty like you could barely see him like he just comes yeah. out so convenient this is no joke nancy this isn't even a movie this is for real <sighs> you bet your ass this is for real you bet your ass is for real <laughs> like it's such like a super it's almost like bordering on my guess and he's like this play it's becoming this like super villain and it's just it's just hilarious but really cool to me at the same time so <laughs> yeah 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 i was i was starting to notice like all of those other like yeah cinematic influences there too um like the yeah them being like kind of strung up like that it reminded me of um uh i don't know if you ever played the the rockstar game manhunt but that's basically a game where uh you're you're playing as a main character who's trying to survive a full-on snuff film and oh, uh wow. killed killed to get your way out of like this like underground prison um you're playing a character that is technically horrible himself but everybody else is just more crazy so you're just kind of like out there to survive and so there's the director played by brian cox in that game who is um uh for the first time navigating you through um the rules of the game and how to how to get by and then eventually like you just kind of muster up this courage you're like i'm gonna go kill the director because he's he's fucking my life up too <laughs> um so, but i was i was getting reminders of that um i don't know if you ever tuned into back in their early heyday they're they're very cringy now but the the channel awesome folks who they, they used to do like these movie reviews but it was a bunch of different okay yeah they're, they're a bunch of these different um I, I they were like early youtube reviewers and one of them was a guy named Brad Jones, and he made a feature film back in like the early 2000s called Cheap. 
And I remember watching it and now having seen this, he takes not only too much influence from this film, he kind of rips it off in many ways. It's like I told you, Manny, revolutionary, a wider range than the area between your couch and under your bed. Now you know I wasn't lying to you. Jesus Christ, Jake, we made a fucking snow film. No, we made... Yeah, yeah, let me guess, harsh reality. Yeah, you laid that one on me already, Jack. We made a fucking snow film. Okay, okay Manny. Snuff films don't exist. Okay, Manny, fine. We made a fucking snuff film. So fucking what? And yes, snuff films do fucking exist, Manny. You want to know why? I just directed one, and you just filmed one. And once this fucker gets distributed, we are going to be fucking pioneers, my friend. This is really hitting all those beats. I like. I now I know where you got your mm. your influence from, and and maybe you're a little too on the nose. Maybe you could try to do less the Tarantino thing and do something a little bit more your own territory and like yeah I don't know I won't call him out too much but it, it's it's that kind of thing where I was I was I was seeing parallels more and more this film looks like it really did do a, a number for a lot of up-and-coming filmmakers which is kind of cool yeah no that it, that is cool and it's also uh as I was kind of that reminds me as I was saying earlier about how this is kind of one of those things that you discover that's sort of this like hidden Gem, it, it's almost a perfect uh, playground for those like filmmakers who discover it's like, ah, oh, nobody knows about this, so I can steal from it, and no one's gonna know. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it also feels feels like that as well. Um, and then speaking of being on the nose, I think uh, there's plenty of moments in this movie that uh, I think fit that bill too. That are really funny. I mean, uh, the, that scene we were talking about earlier of when um, they're showing that like really the kind of amateur, shoddy. Uh, adult film um the 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 uh, producer steve he he straight up says he's like i'm not interested in art he's like i'm not and then it just cuts like it's like so um yeah definitely very on the nose but i think uh, i think it works i think it's uh it's it, it a lot of this film just feels like a like a mockery of a lot of those kinds of people and um also a mockery of even like the directing process itself you know when um when terry when they're like psychologically just like like fucking with uh you know all of the the, uh, the adult film characters there the rich people um he's like strapping him in that director's chair and they're like making this like mock movie and he's like come on you've been doing this all your life start directing and um he's telling the girls to you know there's no like and that's the other funny thing too when when they're doing this mock film set there's no artistry in it it's just oh get the girls up front and you know and there's there's no subtlety to it it's just like i just love how it's it's making almost making fun of like that very shallow kind of process of you know movie making there and i, I think that's uh it's just yeah hilarious to me <laughs> so yeah i uh, love when the light bulb clicks and he thinks like oh you don't really want to direct you want to act you want to be in the picture <laughs> <laughs> and then uh oh yeah and there's that part where he's uh that guy jim and they're like torturing him and he's behind that fake screen and then they push him in front of the screen and they're just like you should have stayed behind that screen palmer and then he's like i'm directing this it, it's so it, it's 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 scary but like it's these these characters are like again terrifying to if you were to ever come across them but they're very funny too and in, in a really fucked up way but to me, to yeah. me at least so. <laughs> yeah so. absolutely yeah and I, I think yeah and that's that's the most underrated quality of this film is that there's so much humor to be had to amidst like amidst all of the the brutality of it and i think it's 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 so so earned and i think that, that it, it, i think the highlight too is that you can tell everybody involved even with uh the added drugs and uh, induced uh, i guess in yeah um whatever else was involved like there uh they were having fun they were having a lot of fun making this and um that's sometimes that's rare to see and I, i'm so glad that they were able to accomplish that you could tell everybody got along they were all friends I, that that kind of camaraderie is is sometimes so hard to come by and i i when you can see it kind of like live off of the screen that way yeah more power to you
that's 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 great yeah i i totally um i, I totally feel what you're saying and um and you know i just i just love how um i don't know i guess i i'm just kind of comparing you know two different contrasting things all the time but but again i just love how a film that's about something so brutal and so fucked up has that wholesome quality of like they were just having fun with it all and i think that's i think that's great i think it's a really nice thing um oh yeah and another, another funny part too is uh when uh uh terry visits the cameraman bill and like his little closet like there um it's like, like film strips hanging all over yeah. the place <laughs> yeah just like and again there's like a citizen kane book right there it's like the, the most unsubtle things like okay this guy loves movies you know <laughs> but uh and like dracula posters everywhere um but i love when uh you know like um terry's trying to be like he's very charismatic and like trying to be very suave with everything and conniving with everything and he's like he's like well um he's like putting out a cigarette like in his room and he's like well we need a cameraman and since you're the best one i know i thought i'd get you in on it and then the guy kind of he's like the one guy that sort of calls him out and his bullshit the whole movie he's like well i'm the only cameraman you know <laughs> like you know he's just and and then and then terry kind of tries to like well you must be the best you know <laughs> like it's just stuff like that to me is funny so yeah yeah i was gonna say marking his territory with the cigarette just like very quickly like yeah. you need me as much as i need you <laughs> no no exactly it's it's like that classic trope that i think is always entertaining mm -hmm. well i think you you kind of said it best on just recommending it to somebody who would be at the very least curious about it um just uh, i would say if you have any sort of um uh fixation with like the more grungier, uh, murkier, dirtier looking films of that time period. And we're talking like early 70s when uh, stuff like this wasn't really being done all too often. And uh, people wanted to. That's the beauty in this, too, is that like there could have been a lot of different last House on Dead End Street movies that just never got produced and never really saw the, the light of day. But uh, this is one of those examples where, you know, uh, it really did kind of push boundaries, but also kind of uh, showed a really fun, entertaining side to what you could do at the time when a lot of people, a lot of naysayers were saying you couldn't do it or uh, shouldn't do it. And they did it anyway. Um, it speaks to that underground uh, scene. It speaks to that New York scene. It speaks to the horror scene. Um, and hopefully, you know, like maybe like this film does find even fuller restoration in the future um it keeps getting those polishes a three-hour cut is is underway I, I i'm noticing more too like more film scholars and more film historians are really actually doing uh uh i guess like a, a 180 take and, and going back to this film and seeing what they missed or what they might have criticized at the time and actually doing a, a full-on reflection which i think it's cool that a movie can even you know elicit that in somebody who who would have been so judgmental towards it so i would say to anybody that's curious yeah give it give it a check it out it's available on tubi right now you can watch the 2k transfer on the uh, vinegar syndrome version uh of his film corruption uh the other thing i want to i want to watch more of the of this guy's movies i don't know if you if you've seen anything else of uh um of uh roger's films have you have you at all or uh i'll i admit i have not so i'm one of those people who uh you know hasn't hasn't ventured further into that which which i really want to because speaking of that i heard that um so while his other films are yeah like they're porn movies as you said um they're actually uh the the, the porn scenes in, in his films are actually um supposedly directed by like other people and then so the the film around it is actually something more akin to um like a serious movie like kind of like like this for instance um and then so i think i read like the if you take like the adult scenes out of it it still works as like this cohesive um you know nihilistic uh very like, kind of serious and disorienting and um just kind of uh yeah like sort of horrific really cool movies and things like that so um which uh which again i i, I think is cool i think again it just speaks to that like idea of this desperation to try you know to want to like do do your uh what do you want to do artistically but knowing the realities of the the industry and the commercialization of it all knowing that you have to kind of do like just something that you don't really want to but it's it's how you're going to get your 
movie made or it's how you're going to get your art, you know, seen. But I just like the idea of like, well, I'm going to secretly disguise this as, as my, uh, you know, like, like my own vision, you know? So I, I think that's a, that, that's a really cool thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't have said better myself, Alex. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think that just about covers it. Uh, yeah, definitely give this movie a watch if you haven't yet. It's it's still, I think, criminally misunderstood. Um, I'm going to rewatch it again at some point or at least put it on for a few folks. Um, whether they like it or not, that's their problem, not mine. So, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Alex, thank you um, so much for coming on the show. Uh, this was a lot of fun and it's good to just kind of feature new guests once in a while. I've been doing a lot of repeats, but like... I need some refreshing voices. Yeah, you, you, you were you were good. You were good to have on, and uh, I wanted oh, to thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. And quickly ask, like, uh, what anything you'd like to plug, or anything you're working on, or anything that's coming up, or just stuff for people to know about. Uh, go ahead and plug away. Uh, this is your this is your time to shine. So. I appreciate that. Um, so as Jeremy mentioned earlier, uh, my uh, my band is called XK Scenario. And um, yeah, we are we are a band that kind of mixes elements of uh, progressive rock and hip hop put together. Um, so essentially, um, you know, King Crimson and bands like that mixed with uh, with hip hop and, and a lot of jazz and a lot of really, um, you know, influences like that. And uh, yeah, we have um, we're, we're on on Instagram, of course, you know, all the all the social media is there and um, we're working on putting out some new music soon. And um, yeah, so check that out. Perfect. Yeah. I'll provide any links necessary in the bio and um, yeah, definitely check out some of uh, the work that Alex and, and the rest of the guys are putting out. It's, it's uh, I listened to some of it and I, I it got me quite, quite jazzed and uh, <laughs> I, we got to stay connected because I might need your help on future stuff for sure. Oh yeah. I would love to. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Um, and then you can follow me over at Jeremoby. I'm over on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also on Odyssey, where uh, most of the other episodes that uh, deal with copyright issues usually end up going. Um, you can also follow me over at SoundCloud, where you can listen to all the Flea Pit After Dark episodes, including any of our best and worst of the year uh, annual shows. Uh, I just dropped one recently uh, with my good old buddy Jake and... I believe that's about all I have at the moment. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Alex, for coming on. This was a lot of fun and a great film to talk about. Uh, really appreciate it. No, th thank you. Thank you. I mean, this was something that I've been, I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, and uh, just, again, thank you. I'm really grateful for it. Yeah, of course, man. And the rest of you listening and watching, have a good night. <laughs> <laughs>